<laughs> Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, an excellent start, I think, to today's uh, sessions. Uh, and we're going to follow that up with, I think, another excellent addition. Uh, Mr. James F. Gertz was confirmed in early December, so we are getting a chance to hear from him about a week and a half before his four-month anniversary as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development and Acquisition. Uh, he is responsible for overseeing a, about a $60 billion budget in acquisition of goods and services in support of the Navy and the Marine Corps uh, to field the best fleet possible uh, for the sailors and Marines. His previous experience is one that feeds exceedingly well into this. He was the head of acquisition at the United States Special Operations Command, U.S. SOCOM. If you'll please join me in welcoming Mr. James Hondo Gertz. How's everybody doing today? All right, awesome. All right, I promise you only one slide. All right. Uh, I'm not going to do the DOD thing and give you a 900-page PowerPoint briefing. Hey, uh, I, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Navy, but I really don't want to be this too focused on the Navy, uh, but I will use it a little bit as uh, a big agency with a great history, uh, you know, very, uh, very successful, uh, but also sometimes, uh, you know, um, can be hampered by that legacy and success. Uh, and so what I really want to focus on is how we're looking at um, getting uh, speed and agility and operational responsiveness uh, in a large organization uh, and how we're trying to get what I would call multi-dextrous. So how do I be good at building a carrier which takes 40 million man hours and also be good at a rapid algorithm that I got to get in, on a network in five days? How do you teach an organization uh, to have a portfolio approach uh, so that you can be good at a lot of different things, not just experts at one thing. And I think for all of us in the audience, that's one thing we struggle with, whether you're in a big corporate organization or whether you're in a government agency, I don't think that's DOD unique. So I want to share a little bit how we're going after that. Uh, and then uh, a little bit, uh, especially for the government folks and the up and coming government folks in the room, um, where do I look for, what do I look for in strategic leadership? What do I look for in companies? What do I look for? What do I think we all need to create uh, and build as an enterprise if the country is going to remain uh, competitive uh, and on a winning team? And everything I do is, is with that thought in mind. If you've, hear, if you've read the National Security Strategy, it's all about how do we compete and win. Uh, and that's kind of the measure I put everything in. And so when you hear me talk about the Navy, when you hear me talk about kind of our 3D vision, when you hear me talk about people, it's kind of in that mindset. Uh, and again, it's a long game. We're not going to fix it overnight. Uh, but if we don't start fixing it, I think we're going to continue to see uh, our security erode as it has, I would say, vis-a-vis -vis our competitors over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and that's worrisome. And I think that's why we're all here together. Uh, this is an awesome, awesome group of folks and a great agenda. You, know, you don't know how lucky you are to be in this room with, I saw the agenda. I'm sure the administrator and I would love to be in here in this room doing this, not in the Pentagon and in, in GSA. But, but one thing we don't do terribly well as a government or as a larger enterprise is actually share things that are working across. I mean, I can just speak within the Navy, we're challenged. Within the DOD, we're really challenged. Within the federal government, we're super challenged. Uh, and so again, I would, you know, if I put on my SOCOM hat, the best, best way to do something fast is steal it from somebody else, right? So I was not that smart, but I was a good poacher, right? I could steal and adapt from anybody. That's what you guys ought to try and get out of a forum like this. If you're not doing that, uh, then you're wasting somebody's money, whether it's your company's money or, or your uh, or you're a government agency. So please, uh, please share, please tell what works, doesn't work. Uh, that's how we're all going to get better. Um, so the Secretary of Matters put out the National Defense Strategy um, that's been out for a while. That builds on the National Security Strategy. I've been in the DOD for 30 years. This is the first strategy I could really understand and incorporate. We've all lived the you know, strategy, be good, be competitive, build a winning team, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then it never really talked about how to get there. So if you haven't read that, even if you're not a DOD person, I would encourage you to pull it up and read it just because 
There's a couple things in it. One, it gives a pretty good compelling vision, right? A winning team, a competitive team. How do we compete and win? And it also talks about what we're not going to do or what we're going to take risk on. And most strategies don't do a good job of talking about what we're going to stop doing. All it talks about is doing better. Uh, and so in that strategy, right, it talks about how are we going to compete and win on a global scale. The Navy's piece of that, what I would call the naval force, so Navy, naval force meaning Navy and Marine Corps. So what's our piece of that, right? How do we engage globally? How do we remain competitive? How do we compete and win across the whole spectrum of challenges we're going to see, whether that's supporting uh, natural uh, disasters like in Puerto Rico, or uh, if it comes to it, a full-on uh, you know, conflict uh, at a global scale. And so for me to do that as the acquisition guy, right, delivering capabilities and services, I've kind of boiled it down into four pretty simple stuff. Right? We've got to deliver. So processes are great. Talking about contract types is great. Talking about compliance measures is great. But if you're not delivering output, you're not relevant to the game here, right? So I measure everything we do on output. Processes help me get there, don't get me wrong. We need to prototype processes just like we prototype pieces of gear. Um, but I'm a very output fo focused kind of person. And what I find is when you focus on output and quite frankly on time, right? Time is the one thing you can never get more of. You can't do a budget request for more time, right? If you focus on output, and shrinking time, that I've found has been the most successful strategy to deliver for the customer. So that, again, requires you to prioritize, requires you to understand what your customer really needs, what your minimal viable product is. Uh, but if you start shrinking time and really challenging yourself, um, that's where I found we get, again, exponential growth, not just incremental growth. Uh, again, processes are important. A contract type is important. Um, but those are all just tools to get to an output. Uh, and so for my number one output, how do I deliver lethal capacity to the fleet? Right? And so that's my kind of number one uh, measure. Increasing agility uh, is something, again, I take a lot of that from uh, SOCOM. I see some of my SOCOM buds out here uh, from the past. Right? And to me, agility is kind of in all dimensions. Uh, and one of the challenges I think we tend to have is we try and at least the Department of Defense, let me define a perfect process and I will drive everything into that perfect process and I will measure compliance and I will hire a workforce that's expert at one thing. That's not what I want, right? If a FAR Part 15 contract was a violin, I have an entire uh, service that knows how to play the violin well. Some are fiddlers, some are concert violinists, uh, but if they got to play a tuba, we try and make the violin look like a tuba. So I think one of the successes we had SOCOM, we had about 17 different ways to acquire things. And then we trained our workforce and valued folks that could pick the right tools for the job or the right set of tools for a job. We also tend to get a little bit in this mindset of, okay, it's gonna be an OTA, or it's gonna be a FAR Part 15, or it's gonna be a commercial, con it could be all of those. So our most successful efforts are when we blended all of those strategies together. So you might have an OT for a piece of the work, you might do a prize challenge for something you're not sure of, you'll have a couple of SIBRs lined up to work on new technology, and so when I look for program managers, when I look for agility, it's how do we get that portfolio approach to solving problems, not just a single way that we can do everything. Uh, and that, to me, gives you a lot of organizational innovation and bandwidth. Um, affordability is another piece. You know, it costs us a lot of money. I mean, the DOD, you look at the price of things and you really struggle at the price of things. But it's not just the equipment. It's all your internal costs. It's all your overheads. I asked for a proposal this big and then I'm frustrated that you put all that back to me in overhead, right? And so all of that costs money. So I'll go back to this time thing, this sense of urgency. Anytime I can take out time, I automatically take out cost. And somehow there's just a little bit of this misnomer that going faster should cost more. And I find it exactly the opposite. Going faster should cost less. You're not carrying a marching army. You're not chasing the periphery of requirements. You're not changing 
uh, it really focuses your prioritize. Again, you gotta prioritize that. So again, driving affordability. The other piece we're really looking at is in back end costs. We exquisitely measure how much it's gonna cost to build something new and do reams and reams of analysis and study and have a very competitive contract award. And then in sustainment, it's kind of the non-program of record. We just gotta pay what it costs and, and we don't really, we don't spend as much intellectual on the government side or, or with our suppliers. And for us, that's about 70% of our costs is after delivery. Um, but we tend to, okay, that's the, that's the O&M bill, we'll just keep paying that. Okay, let's focus on the new laser. Uh, meanwhile, we're, we're hemorrhaging on the other side. So really spending a lot of time on that uh, affordability piece and really looking at technology as a way to drive affordability in the back end of programs. Uh, and then none of that works without right, the workforce. So one thing I have learned in 30 years of scar tissue, it's all about people and culture. Um, if you don't have the right people and you don't have the right culture, it doesn't matter what your processes are, doesn't matter what your relationships are to other stakeholders, you really gotta go after that. So I spend an enormous amount of my time on that end of the business. All right, so I've gotta go figure out how to build 355 ships on a 250 ship budget and all sorts of other stuff. So great challenges, how are we really gonna, so that's kind of what we wanna do. Again, a pretty simple guy, three Ds, right? Decentralize, right? We all have a habit, I see it across government, that there's no penalty for pushing a decision up a layer in the chain of command. Uh, and so one of my number one pushes is decentralization to the lowest capable level in the organization. That's really hard for senior leaders who are all accountable for what happens at that lower level of the organization. But if we don't make that flip, right, we'll never get there. And part of it is back to this developing people. I want folks who are just learning the business, if they're gonna stub their toe, stub their toe very low in the organization where I can recover from that. I don't want you stubbing your toe when you're building a $13 billion carrier. Right? But if we don't push decision making all the way down, and this is corporately and, uh, and in government, we never give the chance for the up and coming folks to actually learn. So their first chance of learning is at a point where I can't afford for them to learn at the same level. So we're massively decentralizing the organization. Uh, and then some tricks to go with that. How do you measure, how do you, how do you make sure you're still on the rails? I, I come from an intent based organization. So I find with intent, and priorities you can decentralize, right? The second piece I talked a little bit about is differentiate. So I should not spend as much contracting bandwidth to award a $100,000 shipper contract as they do a $100 million modification to a boat. But we do that right now. The process doesn't really care on, you know, it's, a, it's so, and again, that comes, that's on both sides of the fence. You know, I, I see industry complain about the government yet it takes you 90 days to get a, a proposal through your corporate that's over a million dollars, right? So don't talk to me about speed and RP if you can't match me on the other side. So again, how do we differentiate and create a bunch of different ways to do things? This may be where OTAs are helpful, or if GSA's got a tool we can use, and that's the best tool for that job. So how do we differentiate the work so we can really put the focus where we can't afford to fail and allow us some organizational innovation bandwidth where we actually, quite frankly, need to be failing 50% of the time or we're not trying hard enough. Right now, the process doesn't do that very well. All right, and then the last is digitize, right? And that's digitize in all facets of work. Right, I'm about ready to do my taxes. I can do TurboTax. Why can I not do TurboTax to write an RFP, right? Why did I not just say, okay, is it this, is it that, right? We, we, Part of it, maybe we have 15 different contract running systems. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different problems. But you know, how do we harness digi digitization to actually let our work go much quicker? You know, electronic bids, all that kind of stuff. And then how do we digitize so that the work we're doing is much more effective? In my case, why you know, building a carrier digital all the way through allows us to do a bunch of different things. And then third, how do we think fundamentally differently about software and how we buy uh, develop, field, and support software. Uh, because, right, most of us just treat it as a lesser offense of a piece of hardware. And we buy it in a, in a similar sense. And, and I don't think that's the right, you know, I told the folks at SOCOM before I left, I, I thought if we couldn't identify the requirement, 
builds a solution, get it on the network and get it in the field as a piece of software in seven days or less, we were gonna fail. You cannot take a traditional acquisition approach to software uh, in that kind of realm. Even defining what, what is IOC or initial operating capability or you know, all our milestone-based ways of looking at it is not gonna work. So again, how do we harness that digitization across the board? All right, so that's kind of where I'm going. 3D is how we're gonna get there. And I wanna just talk a little bit on people and the workforce we need, All right? And, and you know, when I look for, and again, if you're up and coming, uh, and it's great to see a lot of up and coming folks here in the audience, um, what am I really looking for? What, are, what sets apart really good senior uh, strategic leaders, uh, leaders in organizations from everyone else? I'm gonna give the, you know, the competence, integrity, I mean, that's a base level entry fee. All right, if you're not competent and you don't have integrity, there's nothing I can do, okay? If I put that, I'm really looking for three things, and I think this is the, the kind of folks we should try and attract amongst all of us into this enterprise we're all building here. I'm looking for folks with curiosity, right? So you're all here in the room, good. You got, you got your first check on that. Curious what other people are doing I'm trying to really understand with an open mind how they're going after it, right? That is a key trait. If you're waiting to be told, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna be doing much for me. Two, initiative. Okay, so you've seen a lot of great things. You will see a lot of great things. I saw that list of speakers. You're gonna ex expose to a lot of great things. What are you gonna take and actually go do with from what you see here? So who has the guts to see something here and go fight upstream to actually deliver something different versus what we've always done. I had an old boss who was great, uh, a four-star commander at SOCOM, very accomplished operator. He would rarely say anything during your briefing. You'd finish your brief, he'd look at you, and he'd, his first question was, so what was clever about that? <laughs> Are you just doing what you've always done? Is it just the same old thing? You know, what was clever? The first reportable thing on every one of my uh, direct um, reports is they have to do at least one thing every year that's got at least a 50% chance of failing. And that's the first thing I rate them on. Because if I say fail fast, all the buzzwords you all hear, and then don't rate them on that, they don't believe me, right? Now again, pick smartly, don't pick the law, right? Don't pick ethics, you know? <laughs> don't pick the, you know, the mission we're gonna go do tonight. But again, if we aren't willing, all of us willing to, again, try that, if we don't get our iteration speed up and our iteration costs down, so we can afford not to have 100% hits all the time, we're never gonna get there, right? We are never gonna get there as an organization. So curiosity, initiative, and then persistence. Don't wilt at the first contact with the enemy, right? The first time you go up to your functional, your contracts person, or your program manager, and that's not the way we ever done it, now just do it like we've always done it. Now who's willing to fight right, to try something differently, to take on a new approach, to put their professional bona fides on the line. And then if it doesn't work, to own up to it and not blame somebody else, right? Those are the kinds of folks I'm looking for to build the bench uh, behind me. I'm sure the administrator would, would, uh, would have a similar thought. That's what we should be trying to attract and recruit and develop. Now, if we don't give them an opportunity to try young and learn, and fail safely, uh, if we don't empower them to grow, then we're all gonna be sitting here 20 years from now looking at each other, all getting tired and wanting to be retired. Meanwhile, we haven't grown uh, the folks below us. Uh, and so again, I encourage, we got a great mix of folks out here, uh, a super diverse audiences of backgrounds and, and all that. Please help encourage, I think, those tracing folks. If we can do that, we will continue to grow our capability to support the government uh, and compete and win as we need to do to be successful as a nation. All right, so those are my comments. I am wide open to questions if you want, or you can take a break if you want. Whichever you like. No questions, everybody needs coffee. Sir. Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question, and quite frankly, one of the ones I'm finding most challenging uh, 
Well, you know, an, another technique just to bring it is really looking at benchmarking uh, because you can convince yourself that, hey, I did 2% better than last year, so I'm doing well. You might be 2% better from something you're paying five times more than you should or on a process that's five times slower. So that's part of, part of our challenge. I mean, some of our allies do some pretty good work. We do a lot of benchmarking with commercial shipbuilding, but it's a little bit of a different problem. Um, and you know, one of my big challenges, how do we, how do we continue to challenge ourselves, because it's a fairly uh, enclosed industry, uh, government team, to do better and better when we're doing some things like nuclear submarines that kind of nobody else is. That's a real challenge. So then it, it goes back to this curiosity. Okay, go look at a commercial aircraft line. And what are they doing? They're going modular. Okay, so then how do we build modularity? And that's where we're seeing a lot of savings. We say we're saving 20% uh, from the first carrier to the second. A lot of that is building more modular structures and not trying to build it all on the carrier itself. But we're doing a great job of that in submarine. Our, our nuclear submarine program, uh, we've taken two years out of that uh, production span time. A lot of that's modularity and, you know, not waiting to put it, you know, there's kind of a one three eight rule in terms of, you know, what would take an hour back in the back shop takes three hours on the pier and takes eight hours on a ship. Uh, and so how do you push all that back? But you really got to drive after cost. Oh, stand back here. All right, what else? Sir. Not necessarily a question, but I was really intrigued by your thought of requiring people to fail as part of their objectives, because that is sort of the paradox. You can't move forward if you're not willing to fail, but nobody wants to be the one at the end of the year that has a failure on the record. Yeah, I mean, uh, so it's, it's really interesting. I actually take the, uh, just a tech, I do a couple different techniques. One of them is I take the risk, you know, your traditional risk curve that we all get taught in wherever we go learn how to be program managers or whatever, you know, it's probably of occurrence and a consequence of occurrence. You can actually flip that and have an opportunity matrix, right, that says, hey, there's only a 10% chance that this thing works, but if this thing works, I get a 10x benefit. So then the trick is, how do you drive your iteration cost down and speed up, right, so that you can afford to have failures? And you're right, nobody wants to put, you know, 10% of the things he worked on did really work well. Um, so I, I, I kind of don't like to fail faster. I kind of like to learn faster. And so, you know, that, those, that first reportable thing on it's, the, the measure of merit isn't did it work or not. The measure of merit is can you tell me, right? Because sometimes learning something that doesn't work fast is much more valuable than learning something that works really slow. And so I've actually had some folks talk about doing a three-dimensional, it would never work because it would hurt everybody's head. But how do you overlay time on that risk dimension? So if I can learn, if I can take a 10% shot, but really quickly and cheaply take the shot, that's a lot more valuable to me than a 10% shot that is going to take me a long time to figure out if it works or not. So inherently, I kind of put that time equation in there. Um, but again, you've got to create the culture. If I go five times faster than you, I can fail four times and still beat you to the target. And I guarantee you I will have a better solution. And so software is a great example, I think, of where you've got to have that mindset. If you have a mindset in software that you're going to be perfect out the gate, you know, then you're in that big bang software development program that never worked, right? And so it's, it's really, again, how do you iterate? And, and then the challenge is how do you close the distance between the technologist, the buyer, and the operator? Because that, that's another really way to, a way to get that iteration speed. The more you can close that distance, the more cheaply and cost effectively you can get your iteration speed up and then drive your iteration costs down. Uh, but it's tough in public service, right? Nobody wants, it's hard to explain to the taxpayer in public. It's, it's fairly easy in industry because you have board of directors and you can you know, look at the ROI and that board can make a decision. It's really tough in, in public service because the taxpayer thinks anything that didn't work was a waste of taxpayer dollars. Um, we've got to have enough a kind of a portfolio so we can quickly figure out what doesn't work to avert a bill within spending a lot of time and money to figure out what doesn't work, which we've, we've sometimes had a history of doing. Sir. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Oh, sorry. 
So what is the um, latest 10% uh, chance that you're taking with Navy, since Navy doesn't buy as cheap as stuff as so good? Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, a good, that's a good question. I think we're doing a lot on our combat systems. Uh, and so what's kind of interesting is we used to build, so think of all the computers and everything else. So a real challenge in shipbuilding is you've got a ship that you're going to build that's going to last for 50 years, and you only get to touch it about every 10 years. So for the IT folks out there in the room, wow, that, that gets to be complex. And then if you multiply it across a bunch of different ship classes, and they've all got to work together. So the Navy years ago, to their credit, kind of went to this, we're going to separate the combat systems from the structure of the ship and building of the ship. And then we're going to build common combat systems across the ships um, so that each ship doesn't come with its own combat system. Uh, because we just couldn't, the, the cost and support and interoperability was really challenging. And I would say in our submarine force, we've done the best of get on about an 18 month cycle with continuous rolling uh, improvement, uh, which I think is good. I think where the Navy has got the opportunity in the 10% shot are how do we now quickly leverage commercial and small business entrepreneurial kinds of products and quickly leverage them into big existing platforms. So there's a great base of unbelievable technology out there. I saw it at SOCOM. Uh, we put it effectively into the war. The 10% shot now is how do I quickly put that on a big deck carrier or on a submarine? Uh, and then how do you work the certification piece? The other piece, I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty, uh, very impressed with the Navy's thinking is on additive manufacturing and actually not just doing gadget parts without any manufacturing, but actually thinking through all the certifications, so flight certification or subspace certification, and coming up with a framework so we can classify parts in different classes, and where we can be very dynamic in plastics and everything else um, in the additive manufacturing world and get technology quickly, do that, but also be thoughtful and take advantage of it, be, be thoughtful when I'm working rotor blades on a V-22, I don't want that, you know, I need to understand the mechanics and, and all that of the part. And so I think those are two areas that, that are, are good. And then the third, I would say, you know, Navy set up this digital warfare office, really looking at algorithmic warfare and how do we treat software and algorithms as a weapon system of their own, not just as a, you know, an uh, add-on to something else. I think there's some, back to that digitization in the 3D uh, very interesting opportunities there. Good question. And if we're succeeding every time, we aren't trying hard enough. Ken. Uh, Hondo, you mentioned at the beginning about the life cycle sustainment cost. Our acquisition system is supposedly accounting for that. What is your leadership focus or process changes that you think will bring to bear, bring those costs to heal? Yeah, I think it's um, I think sometimes it's, I mean, I think everybody tries to do the best at understanding sustainment on the front end of a program, but if you take a large deck carrier that we're going to keep for 50 years, right, 50 years ago was 1965 or 1970, so it's also probably not practical to figure out that we knew everything and understood where the world was going. And so where I see the opportunity is, again, applying the same level of business acumen that we do on the back end of programs that right now we do on the front end of programs. And it's not that they're, they're, we got bad people or anything else working on that. It's just getting it out there gets all the attention and then getting it in the field necessarily doesn't. And, and where I've seen both challenges and opportunities is once it's in the field and we've come up with a support strategy and the world changes, we tend to too long try and keep the old strategy and try and shift it 5% at a time, as opposed to where we were seeing huge savings at SOCOM was when we clean sheeted and said, okay, 10 years ago we were fighting like this or operating like this. Now we're operating like this. Does the support strategy we had in place 10 years ago really make sense? And where we could sit down with the operator and talk about customer, how do you want to operate this in the next five to 10 years? and let's put a strategy in place that incentivizes and moves towards that, that's where I see the savings. So again, it's not 
it's just that we don't have a good way to sit down and kind of like we do with, you know, we have very regimented reviews of programs as they go through the acquisition cycle. Once they get fielded, we tend to not have the same level of discipline and review. Uh, and those support strategies are very sensitive to how you actually operate the equipment and how you op operate the equipment changes over time. We just, you know, I think there's opportunity to do a better job of really relooking. And again, the world's changed, right? Um, so the tools you have for automatic tests and for automatic deployment of software and all those things are a lot different than they were 20 years ago. Yet in many cases, we still have a very mandralic approach uh, to going after things. That's where I think there's opportunities. And quite frankly, where small business and a lot of you know, innovative thought, you know, with folks who haven't been living with it for 20 years, sometimes you, know, you get blind to what you've been in for a while can really add value. And that's where I go back to this having an orchestra. So you may have a sustainment program with one OEM sustainer uh, and you're adjusting that. Run some price challenges. Pick a couple of components and try to 3D print your way out. Whatever that is, run kind of portfolio approaches to continue, if nothing else, inform yourself on where the opportunities lie for sustainment improvements. All right, what else? Coffee time. All right, thanks for your help. Have a good day. Thank you.